Welcome, everybody, to my talk. My name is Daniel Wittopf. I work for Bosch. Uh, as most of the people here are German, you probably know it, but I'll explain anyway. So Bosch is one of the biggest car suppliers in the world. Um, we produce e-bikes, engines, uh, home appliances, power tools. The gyros in most of your phones uh, are also made by Bosch. Uh, and as I said, I uh, work in self-driving vehicles. So we are trying to make cars drive and also perceive the environment. I'm not going to try to read the full title here today. It's fairly long. I know uh, recently most people have an attention span of about four words, myself included, meaning today we'll be talking about compile time sparse matrices. Fairly easy title. So I gave a talk two years ago at this very conference when it still was completely online. And back then, the topic of the talk was physical units in vectors and matrices. So this was about how can we represent especially non-uniform physical units and vectors in matrices. For the uniform case, it's fairly easy. For the non-uniform case, it can get fairly complex. Back then, the mission statement or the goal was to annotate linear algebra types with semantic information at compile time. And all of this was done to prevent all incorrect usages at compile time by firing static assertions if the user does incorrect operations. One example of such an incorrect operation would be if you model mathematical points and displacement vectors, so the connection between two points, then you only can add a point and a displacement vector, but you cannot add two points in a mathematical sense that doesn't make sense. And back then, the mission statement of the talk was, if it compiles, it works, meaning we try to prevent all misuses at compile time. But as you probably know, it's not 2021 anymore, so we are today in 2023. So today's topic is compile time sparsity for matrices. And here, we again follow an overarching mission. So the mission is to annotate types, this time with sparsity information, in order to save memory and runtime, if possible. So saving memory for sparse matrices should be fairly straightforward. If we have zero or one entries that are trivially zero or one, we don't have to store them. The same thing holds for symmetric entries. We also don't only have to store like one of the two symmetric entries, and the other one is simply a remapping of that. And all of that is done to make sparse linear algebra code efficient by design. So as we have a new topic, we also need a new mission statement today. And it's no longer if it compiles, it works, but if it compiles, it's efficient. So let's see how far we get today and if we can achieve this. So before I start with the actual content, I want to give a brief overview of my talk. I'll start with a recap, because most of you probably haven't seen my previous talk. I'll explain everything that you need to know for today's talk uh, at the beginning, so no worries if you haven't seen the other talk. That's no problem at all. So uh, what I implemented is called TypeSafe Matrix, the class or the library, and this moves semantic information to compile time, as I said, and among these informations that are moved to compile time are physical units, so which unit does an entry have, there's also coordinate frames that I try to annotate. So, for example, if you have a, a robotic uh, a robot with uh, arms and different joints, then usually each of these joints has its individual coordinate frame, and you don't want to be ending up like adding a position vector from one joint to a position vector from another joint, because that doesn't make sense, really. And the last annotation is also that we annotate the, the type or kind of vector and matrix. So there are covariance matrices, Jacobians, uh, points and displacement vector, as, as I mentioned, and all of this is later on used to achieve the goal of moving the error handling to compile time and preventing all of the operations that don't make mathematical sense. Then the main part of the talk, of course, will deal with compile time sparse matrices in C++, and there we'll move the sparsity information from runtime to compile time. Furthermore, it's not sufficient to just move that sparsity information to compile time. We also have to change the way how we iterate over the vectors and matrices, meaning we have to move the iteration from runtime to compile time. So for today, we'll forget about the famous no raw loops statement by Sean Parent. We'll ignore that and move to something even better, which is no runtime loops. And only if we do that, like switch to 
uh, compile time loops, then we can reap the full benefits of, of this approach. And of course, as I'm claiming this, this is efficient, uh, I should also report about experiments. That will be the last part. And there I'm trying to answer the question whether we can get a free lunch by moving this information from runtime to compile time. A free lunch in that case would be to be both more memory efficient and more runtime efficient. So we'll see if and how far we can achieve that. OK, so this now starts the recap. So in order to annotate all the information at compile time, we need a way how we can sort of tag each of the entries in a vector and matrix with its physical meaning. And for that, I'm using what I'm calling named index structs, and these identify each entry in a vector matrix with a unique name. This simple example here, dx, stands for distance x, so this would be the x position. We derive from a base class that specifies in which coordinate frame we are. Here I picked the vehicle rear axle coordinate frame. Uh, we specify that this is the Cartesian x-axis in that frame, and we also specify the physical unit of that entry. So uh, I should mention that vehicle rear axle coordinate frame in our application for self-driving vehicle, this is usually the, the rear frame of the ego vehicle, and this is the frame in which you represent all other objects, at least usually. Of course, you could pick a different one, but this is the one that makes the most sense. Of course, we're not restricted to one frame. We can also represent entries in different frames. So this here would be dy sensor. This is the y position in sensor frame. And in general, you can just create your own uh, indices and arbitrary frame names. That's, of course, possible. In general, I use the uh, names consisting of three parts. So the first part is the physical quantity identifier that says whether this is a distance, velocity, or acceleration. We have an axis identifier, x, y, z, usually. And the last part of the name is a coordinate frame identifier that specifies in which frame such an index lives. Now, I should also mention why dx doesn't have such a frame suffix. Uh, that's simply uh, for brevity, um, first of all, for the slides, but also in reality, we do it like that. So because the vehicle rear axle coordinate frame is our standard frame, we leave out the suffixes here. So by convention, if there's no frame suffix, it's in that uh, standard frame. Good, then we also need our TypeSafe matrix uh, class. That's uh, fairly simple, at least on that slide. Of course, there are many methods, but um, none of them are important for today. So the most uh, important thing here are the four template arguments. Um, first one is the scalar type, so are we using floats, doubles, integral uh, types for our representation? The second one and third one are row index list and column index list, and these are type lists um, consisting of these indices I described earlier, and there, with that you describe what the rows and the columns in your matrix actually mean. And the last one is what I also hinted at earlier, the matrix tag. This is, for example, a vector tag, delta vector. So delta vector would be a displacement vector. We have Jacobians, covariance matrices, and also something like uh, vector collections, where your matrix contains uh, vectors, individual vectors in its columns or rows, meaning the matrix is just a collection of individual vectors. And the only member in that class is um, a matrix from an underlying linear algebra library. I picked Eigen here. I also have different other backends for in-house library and for Blaze. Um, in this example here, it's Eigen, and the Eigen matrix simply uses the same scalar type as we specified, and you use the size of the row index list and column index list as the sizes of or dimensions of your matrix. So this is what a construction of such a matrix would look like. This here creates a covariance matrix where the rows and columns describe uh, x position and x velocity in our vehicle frame. Fairly easy. And in the constructor, of course, you would list the individual elements in the correct order. All of this is also being checked, but that's more of a topic of my previous talks. If you want to know details, check them out, but it's not that important for today. Now, what we're going to need today is a way to access individual elements in a vector or matrix. So there are two ways. The first one is a bit more type safe than the second one. Uh, this one here calls coefficient as i. You have to list the row and column index. And this gives you a physical quantity or the physical quantity with a value of the respective entry in your vector or matrix. This also has a nice side effect, uh, as we have to specify the indices at compile time as template arguments. 
we can guarantee that there's no out-of-bounds access here. So it's just impossible you would get a static assertion if you ever try to access this thing out-of-bounds. And the second uh, bit less type-safe way is to use the add method that simply returns a plain scalar, so the underlying float double integral type, whatever is stored in the matrix by reference, so we can read from that and we can also write to that. So for today, that last method is actually the only thing that we're going to need from the methods in the library, because all the rest is built on top of that. I also want to show the two or three important classes in the library. So as I said, most important one is type-safe matrix, and that inherits in a CRTP pattern, uh, pattern from matrix base with itself as a template argument. So matrix base is sort of the, the base class that provides the common operations for proper matrices and for matrix expressions. And that such a matrix expression here um, has two template arguments. The first one is a promotion type. And that promotion type is responsible for inferring the template arguments of your resulting uh, matrix. So it infers the new rows, the new columns, and also the new matrix tag in case this might uh, has to be changed. Furthermore, it also does all the error checking. So what I mentioned before, when there's error checking, this is usually done by the promotion type because the promotion knows which, which operation we're executing and also knows all of the preconditions. And the second template argument for matrix expression is a matrix expression from the underlying linear algebra library, so in our case Eigen, and this is responsible for doing the runtime calculations. So the promotion does the type promotion at compile time and all the runtime operations are sort of factored out to the underlying linear algebra library. So this is what it looked like in my previous talk, but for today we also want to incorporate sparsity in our vectors and matrices, and for that we have to modify it slightly. So most important thing here is at the bottom we have to add an extra template argument to our matrix, which is a functor, and this functor is responsible for specifying the sparsity, so it says which entries are zero in a matrix, which entries are one, or which entries are remapped, because for example it's a symmetric matrix. We will later on see full details, how that look like, uh, looks like. For now, uh, let's just keep in mind that functor specifies our sparsity. And of course, we then also have to modify the linear algebra expression, template argument of matrix expression, because Eigen doesn't offer support for compile time sparse matrices, so we have to implement the operations ourselves for that. I should also mention if something is completely uh, unclear, I'm also happy to answer brief questions uh, right in between. So if somebody doesn't understand anything or has a like, question that's important for understanding, feel free uh, to ask that. Later on, I also have a, a small quiz for you, so uh, I would be happy to have audience participation later on. Good, this is the last slide from, from my previous talk. This sort of visualizes how the checks in, such, in the matrix library are done. So we have our, our C++ statement up here, um, where we have a covariance in vehicle frame uh, on the right-hand side, and we try to do a change of basis operation by multiplying it with a Jacobian from the left-hand side and a Jacobian transposed on the right-hand side. And what that looks like is visualized uh, at the bottom of the slide. So we have our covariance matrix in the center, left is the Jacobian, and on the right-hand side, the transposed Jacobian. We can see the row and column indices, and the red numbers are what I call row and column exponents. So these determine how you get to the physical unit of an individual entry. So for a covariance matrix, for example, with both exponents being equal to one, we simply multiply row unit and column unit to get the resulting unit. For Jacobian, on the other hand, we have to divide row unit by column unit. That's why the exponent is minus one there. So we take row unit, raise it to the row exponent, and uh, multiply it with column unit raised to the power of the uh, column exponent. Now, when the library sees such an operation, the first thing that happens here is uh, on the right-hand side, in the orange boxes, we, the library verifies that the index structs are actually identical in the orange box, meaning that these uh, matrices actually de describe the same physical thing. Furthermore, there's also a check that the exponents, row and column exponents here in these two orange boxes, are the sign inverse of each other. And if that's the case, then these two uh, physical units 
cancel out, so the indices sort of disappear, and we get the column indices from the right-hand side that move over to the matrix in the middle, so meaning we've already done the change of basis operation for the columns in our covariance matrix. And now the same thing happens on the left-hand side. There's again a verification step that checks that the indices are identical, the uh, row and column exponents are the sign inverse of each other, and if that's the case, these indices disappear, and the row indices from the left-hand side sort of are transferred over to the covariance in the middle. And now, as you can see, we have a covariance matrix in a sensor frame, and that's also what we assign it up there in our black box. So this means this is a valid operation that will not emit any compiler errors. If anything would be different here, so if the indices would be mixed up uh, different order from different frames, then you would immediately get a compiler error from the library that tells you, okay, this operation is most likely not meaningful what you're doing here. Good, so much for the recap. Um, now let's move on to the new content, sparse matrices. So for sparse matrices, it's probably important to distinguish uh, between two different kinds of matrices. What most people probably think of when they hear sparse matrices is runtime sparse matrices, where the sparse ma uh, information is only known at compile time. Uh, sorry, at runtime. Uh, that's what you usually have. And furthermore, these uh, classical approaches mostly cover entries which are zero, so entries which are one, or if they're symmetric to another entry, that's also usually not covered with a runtime sparse matrices. Eigen, for example, uh, supports that. Um, yeah, I will later on also have comparisons with Eigen, but that runtime sparse matrix approach is usually fairly slow, so that makes sense if you have really huge matrices, hundreds, thousands of lines and columns, but for fairly small ones, uh, it's just an overhead and doesn't give much benefit. What we're going to focus today on uh, instead is compile time sparse matrices. And for these, the sparseness information is known at compile time. This could be the case due to physical constraints, for example, or modeling choices. So if we have a covariance matrix, we might decide that we don't want to model correlations between positions and velocities. If this is the case, you also get fairly sparse matrices. And I will later on have a few more examples where this really occurs in practice. And as I mentioned, the goal here is also to not only represent entries that are zero, but we're also trying to represent entries which are one, uh, statically one at compile time, and to have uh, the opportunity to model symmetric entries in vectors and matrices. So now I want to give a few examples of sparse matrices. The first uh, type of matrix is what I would more consider matrix shapes. So for example, the easiest one is a diagonal matrix where all the entries are zeros except the entries on the diagonal. Um, I also want to explain, briefly explain the symbols here. So we have um, uh, black uh, symbols is always like an entry that occupies storage at runtime. And anything that's gray here is an entry that doesn't need storage because it's known at compile time. So here the zeros are known at compile time. There's no need to actually store them. Furthermore, we have upper triangular matrices, upper unit triangular matrices where the diagonal is one and only the upper part of the matrix is non-zero and needs to be stored at runtime. Then there are also classical symmetric matrices, so usually all covariance matrices that you have in a, in a Kalman filter, if you know about that, they are usually guaranteed to be symmetric, so this is something where you can immediately use it. I should also mention if I have letters in here, that usually also means uh, black letters, means an entry that occupies storage. I'm just using the letters to uh, symbolize symmetry in that example. So here, for the symmetric uh, matrix, that you can see that these entries are actually symmetric uh, to the ones on the uh, other half of the diagonal. Good, now uh, I move on to even more sparse matrices, so what I would consider proper space ma sparse matrices, no longer matrix shapes. So in this example here, that's a diagonal block matrix, where we have two two by two blocks um, that are actually identical to each other, so the, we don't need to store the second one because we know at compile time that this is identical to the upper block, and the rest of the matrix is zero. A nice example where this could happen is when you have a change of basis operation, for example, for a four-dimensional state vector that contains uh, 2D positions and 
uh, velocities in a given frame, then you have to apply the rotation matrix twice, once to the positions and once to the uh, uh, sorry, velocities. Uh, and this leads to matrix like this. And we only need to represent the rotation matrix once, but we can still use matrix calculus for the whole thing, which is pretty nice. Of course, you could unroll that uh, by hand. That's always possible, but yeah, that, that doesn't scale if you have a large code base. So it's really nice if you have, can still use matrix calculus and just multiply two matrices and end up with a correct result. Then there are even more general sparse matrices, like this one here. So here we have two by two blocks that are symmetric, and these are different blocks. This is also something that could happen. An example for that is a covariance matrix, if you want to, again, uh, filter the state of, of a vehicle or something. Uh, and you could may, sometimes you decide, I don't want to model the correlations between positions and velocities. Uh, I only want to model the cross-correlation between the positions and the velocities individually, which would give you such a sparse matrix where, again, half of the matrix is zero and a few entries are also symmetric and remapped to another entry. Now, uh, as I men already mentioned that before, a uh, real-world use case for this is the state transition equation, for example, in a Kalman filter, where the uh, x position is governed by this equation here, dx prime equals dx plus the delta time times the velocity. So we're adding to a position a displacement that is given by the multiplication of the delta time between two observations and the velocity. And if you translate that to a Jacobian matrix that transforms between old state and new state, then this matrix looks like that here, where almost uh, the full matrix is trivial, so we only need two non-trivial entries. Actually, the slide is not 100% correct. One entry would be sufficient because we have delta t twice in there, so we could again use a remapping and just store delta t as the only sort of runtime entry in that matrix and the other one could be remapped to that one, uh, symmetric, that's also possible. Um, I didn't do that for this slide here. Another example coming from a Kalman filter is a measurement matrix. So in that example, the columns of that large matrix are the state that we want to estimate. That would be 3D position, 2D velocities, 2D acceleration, and an orientation of the object. And the rows are the measurements by some virtual sensor that we're assuming, and the sensor can measure x, y position and x, y velocity. And if you have such a matrix, then that's again almost completely trivial. We only need to store two entries at runtime, and all the rest is sort of zeros, ones, and don't need to be stored. Good. So, brief intermission. So this is sort of the, the operation that we'll spend on for the rest of, of the talk. So one of the most complex operations for linear algebra libraries is usually matrix multiplication. So if we can make that as efficient as possible, uh, the rest often just falls off or also is just uh, not that significant. So what we're going to try to do today is to make this matrix operation here, the multiplication, as efficient as possible. So on the left-hand side, let's assume we have a sparse matrix where only 50% of the entries are stored. Uh, the matrix B in the middle is full matrix, and we want to calculate the result C. So if we look at the first entry, C1 of the right-hand side matrix, then this is given by the first row of A, first column of B. We put the entries next to each other, and then we just multiply it out. So C1 equals A1 times B1 plus A2 times B5. And then it gets interesting. Here we have a 0 times B9. Ideally, that operation should just disappear because we're multiplying 0 with something. We don't care. It's guaranteed to be 0. So that should ideally completely disappear. And the last operation, 1 times B30, should just equal B13. That means if we are able to operate like that, that we've come from uh, using four multiplications and three additions to now two multiplications and two additions, which is 50% almost. Good, now let's move on. I hope you've all been waiting for this. Uh, the first slide was actually code. Uh, 
So let's translate this to C++. What does it look like? So we need a lot of template stuff. I'll always try to explain it. So this is basically matrix multiplication helper. The most important thing is that we get a variadic type list of pairs. And these pairs are sort of all of the, the cross product of rows and columns in our matrix. So this sort of describes the iteration over the right hand side, uh, over the right hand side resulting matrix. This is what's given by the pairs. And the iteration is done, as I said, uh, with a compile time loop, fold expressions with C17. And here we are just assigning one entry of the matrix. And what we are assigning is the result of our calculate entry run method helper that we have down here. And this is again another fold expression. And this time we are folding sort of over the uh, columns of the matrix A and rows of matrix B. So this is sort of the, the multiplication that I showed on the previous slide. So we're just doing a fold expression and adding all the multiplication of the individual entries together. So the last thing that's now still missing is the multiply two entries. And this, well, okay. So if we do that, I'll show it on the next slide, multiply two entries. If we do that, then we've already uh, achieved our goals uh, to remove all the runtime loops. So we're now runtime loopless, sort of, because we've all moved everything, all the iterations, to compile time. Good, as I said, um, we're still lacking the multiply two entries run. So this is simply a method with three or four if const express. The details are not so important. The most important thing are the if const express here. So we're checking whether either the left-hand argument or the right-hand argument is zero in our multiplication. If that's the case, yeah, we simply return a zero. If both uh, arguments are one, we're returning a compile time one. If the left-hand side is one, we're returning the right-hand side. We don't need to do a multiplication then. If the right-hand side is one, we're returning the left-hand side. And last but not least, of course, there are also cases where both values are runtime values. In that case, we have to do a multiplication. There's no way around that. And we simply return the multiplication of the two individual entries from the left and right-hand side matrix. Good. And if we've done that, we've already come really close to our mission statement. If it compiles, it's efficient. As you can see, yeah, the if const express sort of takes care that we get the simplest compile time value. So if we have to do runtime operations, we get the runtime result. If not, we get compile time values. Good. Uh, but now I want to move back. That's also a really nice connection to uh, the opening keynote by Kevin Henney. We're going to need uh, some of the stuff that he talked about. I hope you all paid close attention. The key question now is, so we have this fold expression down here where we uh, add several, entry, uh, several multiplication results, and some of these multiplication results are zero. So now question for you, what do you think? Does the compiler completely optimize additions with zero away? Can this be optimized away? Does anybody have an idea? Just random guess. If you don't know, that's also fine. Yes? So you're saying yes. Uh, also not completely incorrect. It depends. <laughs> so if you would tweak with uh, uh, floating point settings, then maybe the compiler is able to optimize it away. But with standard um, floating point settings, this uh, adding a zero, a positive zero to something is not an identity operation. Because minus zero plus positive zero is minus zero, uh, sorry, is positive zero. Uh, so it's not an identity operation, meaning the compiler is not allowed with at least standard floating point settings to optimize that away. And as we usually don't want to play with floating point settings, um, we have to find a different way how we can solve that. Uh, fairly easy. So. Um, uh, earlier when Kevin Henry talked about that, I looked it up and I think that there might be another solution than what I present. So if you just return a negative zero, I think that might also work uh, for the zero entries because the addition with a negative uh, zero seems to be an identity operation. But we can do something even better. We just, well, we are compile time. We know which entries are zero. We'll just move, uh, remove all of the zero entries from our cross product in our type list, which also makes maybe even easier for the compiler in the fold expression down here. So we just remove that. And then we don't have to rely on any compiler optimization. We can simply guarantee that these terms are taken out of the addition and the compiler doesn't even see them. 
which is always better than having to rely on compiler optimizations. Meaning if we've done that, we've truly achieved our mission statement. If it compiles, it's efficient. Good, the last thing that's still missing that's not directly related to the multiplication is a, is a simple element access. So if we access one element in our matrix with the add method here, then that's again fairly long, but yeah, basically it contains three or four if const express. If uh, the functor indicates that this entry is zero, we return a zero. If it indicates that it's one, we return a one. And in the case that there's a remapping, we simply ask our functor what is the remapping remapping to, sort of, and return that value. And the last else is then simply the standard case if we have a full matrix um, without symmetry, then you simply return the one element in your underlying area or whatever you use as storage uh, that belongs to this entry in your vector matrix. Good, now the one ingredient that's still missing is the sparsity functor. I talked earlier about that, and now I want to explain what sparsity functors look like. So this here is a functor for a symmetric uh, matrix. First thing that we're going to need is a method get entry kind, and this will sort of return whether an entry is zero, one, or a normal entry. In that case, for symmetric matrices, it just always returns normal. And there's another way how we can identify the remapped entries, and this is done with a method is entry remapped that just returns true or false whether an entry is remapped to another entry. And if it's remapped, there's also that remapped index pair uh, template alias that specifies to which index it's actually being remapped. And in the case of a symmetric matrix, it's fairly easy. We just swap row and column indices, and that gives you the remapping, remapping target in that functor. Then additionally, we also need the inverse of the functor. We will later see why this is important. Um, for now, just note that we have that. And the last uh, helper template here or it's actually a, a bool constant that indicates whether the content uh, in two indices um, is identical. This will later be needed for error checking or cross checking. So for example, you could have a, a symmetric matrix where you store the upper part and then another symmetric matrix that decides to store the lower part, but it has the same symmetry. And with that helper here, you can verify that, that it's actually the identical uh, symmetry just in the opposite uh, order which is also yeah, equivalent, I would say. Good, now comes the fun part. We have a simple uh, C++ uh, equation here. I should mention that the square bracket, because that question came up earlier, the square bracket here is not true C++ syntic, uh, syntax. It's a bit slideware, though, so that st stands for a type that represents a physical quantity in second. So we uh, taking a matrix, multiplying it with a quantity of one second, and then later on we're taking the transpose. And now, for this example, let's assume the matrix looks like this here. So the matrix stores um, as row indices, velocity indices, x, y, z velocity in our frame with a unit of meters per second. And the columns in our matrix are just numbered indices, so effectively we have two vectors stored in a matrix, and I have to identify them somehow, so I'm using a, a numbered index chart here. And to make it more interesting, our example, we also have a remapping here. So all of the second and third rows entries are remapped to the first one, so they don't occupy storage. So we basically have a vector with all identical entries. In practice, that doesn't make much sense, but it makes for a nice example, which is why I did it like that. So now if we look at our matrix expression here, first thing that we're doing is multiplying with a physical quantity of one second. And if we do that, then we, the multiplication with uh, 1.0 doesn't change the value, so the only thing that changes here is the meaning of the indices in our matrix. So if we multiply a velocity with a duration, we get a displacement vector uh, in the same space. And this is what happens here. And the last outermost operation is the transpose of our matrix, and this simply swaps rows and columns, as I mentioned earlier. So this is sort of what happens when you write such a matrix expression and how the, the uh, semantic meaning of the matrix is, is transformed with that. 
Now we can do a similar thing, um, what I showed before, uh, on the slide before, it was just a, a matrix expression that doesn't occupy storage, so such a matrix expression still refers back to the original storage in our underlying matrix. But what if we want to like, create a new matrix by calling that eval method here that simply evaluates everything into a new matrix. Now if we have a new matrix, we would have to provide a sparsity functor for that, all, uh, for that also. But uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense to, to let the user provide the sparsity information for something that's as complex as this one here. So this has to be done automatically. And on that slide, I want to show how this information can be inferred automatically. So let's just assume we're looking at our red A entry here, and we want to know what that entry is being remapped to in the new matrix that is being created here. So first of all, we have to now pass the, uh, the expression from the outside to the inside and invert all the operations. So we're taking the transpose. It's fairly easy. The inverse of transposing a matrix is another transpose, uh, meaning we just invert rows and columns. And then we used to have a multiplication with one second. This gets inverted to a division by one second, meaning we now change the indices from position to velocity indices back. And now we're already in our original matrix uh, that occupied storage. And now we can query the sparsity functor in that underlying matrix. Hey, what is your red entry A here being remapped to? And that can tell you, okay, it's being remapped to the first row because the second row doesn't occupy storage. And then we have to go the other way up again. We have to go in the forward manner. We again apply the multiplication with one second. Uh, we're doing the transpose, and this sort of brings us back to our, to our result space. And now we have the final result. The red A has turned into the green A up here, and this is sort of the remapping functor for the resulting new matrix that we create with this simple eval call here at the end. Yeah, so a bit of uh, things happening under the hood, but in order to pro propagate that sparsity over all operations, um, this has to be done, otherwise uh, it wouldn't work. Good, now I also want to explain, as I said that earlier, how we can invert a sparsity functor. So the uh, code that we had on the previous slide translates into the type system as this complex type here. So the innermost part, a storage functor that's given by our underlying matrix in the middle of the expression. Then we multiply with a physical unit that wraps that in another template. And last but not least, we transpose it uh, so that wraps it in another template. And now we want to use that inverse functor here to sort of invert this operation. So I will show visually how this is done. We take our large expression here. And then we split that in an outermost blue part and an inner orange part. And what that inverse functor here is doing, it simply exchanges these, uh, exchanges these two parts. So the blue outermost part is transferred to the right-hand side of the colon colon, and the orange part stays on the left-hand side. And now we re repeat that operation. So we again split that into an outer part and an inner part. We move the outer blue part to the right-hand side, and now we only have our storage functor on the left-hand side of a proper matrix, and that functor usually is an identity operation, meaning uh, this is sort of our, our final result here that we have. And now if you paid close attention, I mentioned earlier that the inverse of multiplication is of course a division, so it's slightly different. It's a divide by unit expression that we have here, and this is sort of the, the full inversion of our expression from up here that we have by simply yeah, unchaining this thing and changing the order, uh, this can be done at compile time. Good, now as I said, it's quiz time. Uh, I have a few questions for you, so it would be great if you could try to answer. First of all, uh, let me explain what it's all about. So we have our simple ma uh, very simple matrix assignment up here. We are assigning a matrix B to a matrix A. And the question is, so we have five different options here on the right-hand side. I will step through each of them, and we'll try to answer, first of all, the question whether this assignment is correct or not. Now, I should also mention what, what the question marks mean. Question marks are just entries that we ignore for the, for the quiz, so just they, can, they can be anything, so they don't have any constraints for, for our quiz. 
So let's start with the first one. So on the left-hand side, I should explain that also. So we have a matrix which has runtime entries on the diagonal, marked with an asterisk, and the off-diagonal entries are symmetric, and we only have storage for the upper right entry, and the other one is simply being remapped. And now we're trying to assign this matrix here uh, with two runtime values to our matrix on the left-hand side. Is this invalid operation? So I see. Can you say why it's invalid? Yeah, so I'll just repeat. So on the left-hand side, we have two entries that are fixed to be identical. On the right-hand side, we could have, I don't know, three and five for these entries, and then this wouldn't work. So this could really be a problem. This is incorrect, and we should definitely prevent this operation at all costs. So what about the second one? Should this work? Yeah, that's fairly easy. Same symmetry, that should work. Third one? Yeah, so people also answer yes, and it has symmetry, a different symmetry, but it's sort of semantically equivalent. We just chose to, to put the storage sort of virtually somewhere else. That's uh, the same matrix, and the left-hand side can represent that. We simply assign B to A, uh, the small B to the small A, and then we're done. What about this one? Is this a correct operation if we assign that? So... Everybody seems to agree that yes, so it might be a partially... Well, okay, I'm <laughs> sneak peeking into the later answer, so uh, it's correct. Uh, the uh, operation, we can definitely assign the zeros to A, then we would have a runtime value of zero, uh, but it's still correct, the operation. We're still representing the same thing afterwards. And what about this one here? It should also work. So we have uh, compile time zeros at one on the diagonal. We would store them at runtime values as runtime values. That is okay. And also a correct operation. So if we proceed like this, we prevent the first operation by a compiler error and sort of let all the other operations succeed. Then we sort of achieve the, the mission statement of my talk from two years ago. If it compiles, it works. So there are no bugs in here if we do it like that, it's completely fine. But as I said, we not only want to be correct, we also want to be as efficient as possible. So now for the second part of the quiz, the question is, are the operations efficient? So the first one is fairly easy, it's incorrect, can't be efficient if it's incorrect, so we can ignore that one. What about this one here? Is this uh, as efficient as possible, this operation, if we assign the two matrices? Yeah, so people seem to agree, yes. So we are assigning a symmetric matrix to another symmetric matrix. We don't lose sparsity. Everything's fine here. What about this one? Okay, everybody seems to agree. That's also efficient. Correct, we just chose a different representation. I mean, it might be a different kind of efficiency if row major or column major uh, makes a difference, but in general, uh, we have the same amount of operation uh, of, of operation, so it should be fine. What about this one here? Okay, everybody's answering no. Uh, can somebody answer why? Maybe you again? Why is it in inefficient? It doesn't know it's zero. Okay, yeah, correct. It doesn't know it's zero. So we used to have a compile time zero, and now we're just having a symmetric entry, so we're actually using runtime storage, and the compiler can't know at runtime that this is zero, which means it's not as efficient as we want to, and we're losing sparsity information by doing that, meaning we should prevent that operation. And what about the last one? I guess, yeah, that's also fairly easy. Uh, we're again losing the zero and one on the diagonal, so this is also not really efficient if we allow such an assignment, meaning uh, we should here, uh, if we want to be as efficient as possible, we should again prevent all the uh, red operations here, marked with red. And if we do that, um, we've come really, really close to our overarching mission statement. If it compiles, it's efficient, because we're always preserving the sparsity information over all operations. Of course, in some cases, it also could make sense that you explicitly want to use uh, want to lose the sparsity information, but there's, yeah, you could just provide a special method that says, okay, please drop all the sparsity information, evaluate to a full math, uh, matrix instead. Uh, that's perfectly fine to do it like that. 
Good, so that concludes the part with the explanations. Now I want to move on to the actual experiments and show what that does with runtime. And our famous slogan from the beginning here, I want to also investigate whether we can maybe get a free lunch with this approach by being both more memory efficient and more runtime efficient at the same time. So first experiment is this operation here uh, where we have uh, three matrices, U, D, U transposed. And U is an upper triangular matrix, uh, D is just a diagonal matrix in the middle, and then we're multiplying it with the same uh, now lower triangular matrix because we're transposing U uh, on the right-hand side. This is a fairly common operation in matrix decompositions or so, so this happens quite often, which also means uh, there are nice textbook algorithms that you just can take that implement this as efficiently as possible. And what they usually do is they represent the middle matrix just with a, a vector that only stores the diagonal and also makes use of the uh, diagonal shape uh, of U and U transposed. Good, and when doing that, um, this is sort of the result. I should explain uh, what you see in the plot. So we have the, the textbook algorithms that you usually find in your uh, linear algebra textbooks. And in green, that's the compile time sparse matrices that I presented in the talk. X-axis is the matrix size, so it's always a square matrix, and we go from 6 by 6 to 24 by 24, and the Y-axis is the runtime of our benchmark. And you can already see that um, yeah, textbook algorithm is sort of efficient, but the compile time sparsity is better in certain cases, especially in the very, uh, for the very small values. I also have that on the next slide. For larger values, there's still a benefit, but it's yeah, maybe 20% or so, so not that much. For the small matrices, it really can make up to a difference of 50% in runtime between the two algorithms. Um, so you might ask why this is the case. Uh, I presume it's most, mostly because the classical textbook algorithms still have runtime loops and iterations, so the compiler doesn't really see all the offsets of your entries. And with my approach, all the offsets are known in compile time, so the compiler really knows which, where it's exactly it's accessing memory, and I think this uh, quite often uh, can improve runtime significantly. Good, just for fun, I also included uh, eigen runtime sparse matrices in the comparison, but that's fairly uh, unfair. As you can see, eigen is fairly slow. You also need uh, three arrays to represent uh, runtime sparse matrices because you have the actual values and the row and column indices. You have to access all of that um, at runtime. This is fairly slow, especially for these small matrices. Of course, if it's in the order of thousands, then definitely I guess the other one is better. Your compiler would explode if you try to do the, the compile time thing with uh, matrices of that size. So it always depends what, what your problem actually is. Good. Second experiment <coughs> uh, that I want to report about is this operation here, so we're uh, multiplying A times B times A transpose, and our matrix A on the left and right hand side um, has varying sparseness, so we vary the sparseness in that matrix from 0 to 100%, so we're sort of increasing how many entries are 0 in that matrix, and the middle matrix is always symmetric, so this could be from a covariance matrix that's being transformed to some other frame or similar operation. Now, if we do that, uh, you see a lot of uh, plots here. The most important thing to focus on here is the red one. That's sort of the, the baseline that uses eigen SIMD operations under the hood. So that's full matrices with eigen. And this is sort of the baseline that we compare all the other plots against. And the other plots are just our matrix multiplication with increasing level of sparsity. So the one with the highest runtime has zero sparsity in, in that matrix A. And we increase the sparsity from zero to 90%. And you can see, um, especially for, for the very small sizes, where I again have a, another slide for that, um, eigen is the slowest, but as soon as the matrices get bigger and bigger, uh, eigen starts to pick up with the SIMD operations. And usually, yeah, if you have more than 50, 60% sparsity, um, the compile time sparsity is still better. But I guess uh, if you would increase that further, uh, then eigen would get faster, plus uh, the compile times get, get prohibitive at, at some point. So this is sort of the zoom in of the previous one. So it's just the, the smaller sizes of this one here. And here we can see yeah, for all small sizes, um, the sparse approach is superior to eigen. Um, even, yeah, even with zero sparseness in some cases here for 8, 9, 10. 
So even there, it can make sense to uh, use such an approach. But of course, as always, yeah, you have to benchmark. It depends on your machine, on the kind of SIMD operation. So I wouldn't claim that this is always the way to go, but it can make a big difference, especially if your matrices are really sparse. Good. The last experiment that I want to report about is this one here. And here we have nested sparse multiplication. So in the middle, we have a symmetric covariance matrix. And that's multiplied from the left-hand side and the right-hand si side, again, with the same uh, term here. And the term we're multiplying with is an identity matrix. From that, we subtract the gain matrix, that's a full matrix, and multiply that with a measurement matrix that is fairly sparse, as shown here. So this is, again, an operation that you observe in Kalman filters uh, pretty often. And now uh, I have two different uh, measurements with my sparse approach. In the first one, I'm only using sparse multiplication for the innermost multiplication um, with a measurement matrix and the gain matrix. And uh, in the second uh, measurement that I report on the next slide, I'm using sparse multiplication for all of the multiplications in here, so also for the one with the covariance matrix. So what that leads to is uh, this bar plot here. So we have in in purple, sort of a simple loop where you just iterate at runtime, unroll your matrix operations. This is sort of the, the baseline. Eigen is the green bar with Eigen SIMD operations, of course. And then we have the blue bar, which is only sparse multiplication of the, the innermost multiplications that I showed. And the orange bar, the final uh, bar here, shows what it looks like if we do all multiplications in a sparse manner, meaning we propagate the sparseness through all of the matrix multiplications. And you can see that we can still be uh, approximately 50% faster than, than what Eigen does in that case. So again, it depends on whether you're using float or double precision, but it definitely can make a difference. Good. Um, as we still have a bit of time, yeah. I can briefly show maybe the, let me see if I can skip to that one. This is sort of the compile time plot because it might be interesting. So here we have a number of entries in purple, that's quadratic of course, and the compile time in green, that's more cubic I think. So you can see that this starts to break down uh, at higher numbers. Uh, I thought I'd just uh, include that briefly, but let me go back uh, to this one here. Um, because that already brings me uh, to the summary, and then we hopefully still have time for a few questions, if there are any. So what we've done today, we've combined memory efficiency with runtime efficiency. We've partially invalidated the famous saying here, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So we can get a free lunch in certain situations, but of course, restrictions apply, so please read the fine print. You always should benchmark on your machine, know your problem domain, if it's actually worth it, if you really have sparse matrices, so it's always a trade-off, of course. The preconditions for achieving all that are that we've moved all the operations from runtime to compile time, meaning we've ditched the famous raw loops, uh, no raw loops for today, and replaced it with no runtime loops. And by doing that, we can now enforce at compile time uh, sparsity correctness, so this was sort of in our quiz, the correctness, which sort of satisfies uh, previ the previous mission statement, if it compiles, it works. But in addition to that, we've also achieved maximum sparsity efficiency, which brings us to unlocking our final mission statement of this year, which is, if it compiles, it's efficient. And with that, all that remains for me is to thank you all for listening, participating, uh, and joining the quiz, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Yeah. So, uh, one of the questions was about uh, compile time, but you showed it, so thanks. <laughs> yeah. But the other question would be, uh, what about uh, binary size? Because there are a lot of... Uh, Templates and mm -hmm. with the uh, unrolling and all that stuff, have you measured the impact on the yeah. binary size? Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, no, honestly, I haven't yet measured it, but it definitely makes sense to look at that. Um, I would also assume that it affects the binary size uh, because there's a lot of inlining happening and stuff. I mean, all the uh, if you're lucky, all of the, the type information can be removed at the end, so it's just raw operations. 
Um, but I would also suspect that it has an influence. The runtime loop is something different than yeah, adding, I don't know, 50 values uh, one after the other. So I would assume there's an influence, but I have to measure that. Yeah. Thanks. So your fundamental ab abstraction for linear operations was a matrix, but it could also be an expression like Eigen already has built in. Um, what were your reasons to uh, go beyond Eigen and implement it yourself? Um, so Eigen especially for the sparse? Uh, for the sparse, because yes, Eigen, yeah. an Eigen expression can also encode that it's an expression multiplying with diagonal matrix or... Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, I haven't found a way to, to easily uh, use that in, with eigen expressions. It might have been possible, but I definitely have to modify the underlying storage. So it's no longer an icon matrix that I can store. So I, have a, I just store, I don't know, three out of 20 entries. So you definitely need different storage type. And um, the main difference maybe also why it might not work in Eigen, I have, I'm always uh, accessing with template arguments. So I'm not saying, okay, give, please give me this matrix at index 3, 5, which are runtime indices for Eigen. What I need, so I absolutely need that, is a compile time index. So it could be an integral constant uh, or uh, the types that I'm using, but it wouldn't work if you really have uh, runtime values. And that's probably where it would break if you would try to implement it like Eigen did. Um, so I guess, I don't know, maybe it's possible with some really big workarounds, but out of the box I, I couldn't find anything. So I think that's the main crux if you have runtime indices or uh, template arguments for your indices. Okay, thank you. So, so we have two questions from the online audience. The mm -hmm. first one is if MD span will help the steam matrix operations. Uh, sorry, could you repeat? The first one is if MD span will help you with matrix operations. Okay, um, MD span, that's a slide I took out from a longer talk. I should have left it in, I guess. So MD span in that case would have, I think it would have the same issue uh, that um, the indices are runtime numbers and not, not compile time. And that's uh, the major difference. Uh, I tried to look at it, but I think that would also prevent me from, from using MD span. So all the extents are compile time in MD spans, but I don't think the, the iteration or the, the indices. <coughs> Okay, and the second question, can the compiler generate SIMD code for matrix operations? And can native SIMD operations be faster than compile time sparse matrices? Uh, yeah, the SIMD operations, I mean, we sort of saw that with a comparison to Eigen. Eigen is using as much SIMD operations as it can, can get, I guess. So that should be pretty efficient. But there's also another point uh, in the code I'm producing. There could be some, some auto-vectorization happening. That's one of the points. You could even imagine that you're actually doing like parallelization yourself. That you, if you know your sparsity structure, you could even restructure your rows and columns, reorder them, that you have consecutive blocks that are SIMD operation friendly. And with a library interface that doesn't mention, okay, I'm accessing index three and five, but only mentions sort of the content, like this is an X position index, you can arbitrarily reshuffle the order of your indices and your code will just compile again uh, because yeah, it's agnostic to the actual position in your vector and matrix. Thanks. So I think you almost maybe completely just answered my question, but just to make sure, have you encountered scenarios where breaking up the contiguous storage actually prevented SIMD operations making the entire operation slower? Hmm. Yeah, I haven't really investigated a lot what, if there's actually SIMD being created or not. Um, so it, it definitely can break up things. So I don't know if you, if you would imagine a four by four matrix and only three entries in each vec uh, row are occupied uh, and your SIMD width is, I don't know, wide enough to store four entries, then SIMD is probably pretty efficient by just using an additional entry that's not needed. Um, and with that, you would probably immediately prevent it because you're sort of uh, putting the next three entries after the first three ones and so, uh, uh, the alignment would be violated that you uh, probably need for SIMD operations. So it's easily, easy to prevent SIMD operations with that. Um, so you really have to make up with a level of sparsity in your vectors and matrices for the fact that you can't use SIMD operations. That's also why I said uh, benchmarks are needed for your application. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, yeah, um, my question would be 
do you have you also looked at um, if there's any performance gains versus hardware acceleration? So if you have GPU that can run mat matrix operations quicker due to hardware acceleration, mm -hmm. um, do these overheads from the from the edit uh, f from the structure kind of diminish the returns on hardware acceleration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't tried it on, on GPUs, but I would assume uh, GPUs are pretty efficient with matrix operations. The, the major point with GPUs is you have to often transfer the code to the GPU and back. This is a big overhead, but as soon as it's on GPU, then I would guess uh, yeah, just dump, dump recalculating everything uh, is often more efficient. You would have to measure, but I think there it leans more towards just calculate the whole thing and forget about such an approach. Yeah. I think especially when you're dealing with big matrices. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, and that's also what I said. So what I showed here, the 24 by 24, that's where it starts. I mean, uh, the numbers I showed, that was, I think, 10 minutes compilation time. That was for a whole benchmark set with several operations. So in reality, it wouldn't blow up that fast. But I think if you're at 30, 30, it's probably as far as, it, as you can take it. Uh, and after that, it doesn't make sense anymore. Okay, thanks. Latching on to the last question, um, while developing or for what um, hardware have you been developing? So is this meant to run on servers in a data center or is this actually meant to run on a microcontroller somewhere inside a car? In real time? No, more on the microcontroller. So we're not yet using this in, in production. Uh, so the, the, the compile time checking from my talk pre two years ago, we're already using that. But this one here is sort of, yeah, it's a take it or leave it. So it, ideally, you would have to do that for all the operations that you have everywhere. And then you get the full benefit if you're always converting back and forth between a, a normal linear algebra library and this representation. Uh, then it probably doesn't get you that much, or you just do it in, in your central filter loop uh, that takes a lot of time, that would be possible. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, usually it's like completely transitioned to this thing, then it makes sense. Uh, or, yeah, leave it as it is. I think it's interesting from a product point of view, if I think about the Bosch microcontroller sensor units, which are like all included SOCs, yeah. um, that something like this would be beneficial because you save the money on extra coprocessors. Yeah, on extra yeah. coprocessors, especially you save the memory, first of all, because if the matrices are really sparse, uh, it saves you memory. That's usually also fairly costly if you can reduce that. And then if you, uh, if you can save the memory and you would just be as efficient as you were before, that might also be already uh, worth doing it. And okay. uh, oftentimes you can be more efficient. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, compile time code uh, you've shown. Do you think it would benefit from C++ 20 concepts? Um, yeah, the question whether it would benefit from concepts. What I did uh, today in the talk, not so much, but everything I did in my previous talk, all the compile time checks, it's basically an emulation of C++ concepts with 11, 14, or 17. So, uh, yeah, it's sort of, uh, I'm even calling the thing requires uh, classes that help me with checking all the preconditions. So it's really important. And what I also uh, used a lot is compile time testing. So I'm actually, I have lots of conditions that have to be satisfied otherwise the user gets a static assertion and all of that is being tested so I have three four thousand compile file tests and each of these tests sort of starts the compiler for a small snippet runs the compiler and checks whether the output contains a static assertion which is I think it now takes four hours if you actually do that uh, and uh, with concept you come could completely rewrite that um, because you can actually write uh, requires not requires which checks that something is invalid and just last week, I also found uh, a workaround in older C++ versions where you can do the same thing. So you can modify method return types to return some sort of invalid expression in the error case. Uh, and then you can again check with a single static assert in your test that this invalid expression is emitted. And this sort of also allows you to have thousands of test files in one file, compile it once, and you're done. But yes, I would love to have concepts for that, but we're still at C17 currently. Right. Thank you. So, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, everybody, again. Looking forward to talking with you.